Hello and welcome to another video in my Of Mice and Men GCSE revision series. Today we're going to be looking at crooks and how John Steinbeck portrays racism in Of Mice and Men. So as always uh, in my videos, I always want you to think about this question. What is John Steinbeck trying to say about society in 1930s America? If you're studying for edXL uh, IGCSE, then 50% of your marks are going to be for linking to context. So if you keep in mind what John Steinbeck's trying to say, then that way you'll always be making sure that all your answers are going to be automatically linking to context. So perhaps pause this video for a second and just think, what is John Steinbeck trying to say with crooks? And what would his kind of opinions or political leanings be, do you think? So let's first define some of our terms to do with the context. So first of all, we have the Jim Crow laws, which were a collection of state and local laws that legalised racial segregation, which were enforced in some form for up around 100 years from 1865. So they would essentially, um, if you were white, you would have one waiting room. If you weren't white, you'd have a, another one. It would be the same for a laundrette, for a theatre, for restaurants. So essentially it made um, discrimination essentially legal. And that's the context in which Crooks is living. Also the Ku Klux Klan, a violent racist hate group founded in 1865. In the mid 1920s in America, it had over 5 million members. So the Ku Klux Klan are responsible for incredibly violent crimes, um, including murder um, and lynchings of black people. So when Curly's wife says to Crooks, I could get you strung up on a tree so quick it ain't even funny. Actually, the context is that she absolutely could. If she accused Crooks of doing something, there would be, pe there would be people in society who would want to, in their, word, in their kind of opinion, punish Crooks, um, even if it was based on a lie and he hadn't actually done anything. Um, so yeah, the, the kind of violence underpinning uh, Crooks' existence in society uh, is definitely something that we need to kind of consider and explore. So let's look at how Crooks is first introduced. So this is when Candy is speaking to George and Lenny when they first arrive at the ranch. The old man said, I guess the boss will be out here in a minute. He was sure burned when he wasn't here this morning. Come right in when we was eating breakfast and says, where the hell's them new men? And they give the stable buck hell too. The boss gives him hell when he's mad. So when the boss is angry, even if it's got nothing to do with Crooks, Crooks is the person that he takes it out on. So already we've got this idea that Crooks um, is subjected to unjustified violence. So he is punished even when things aren't his fault. And we've got this idea that he's bottom of the hierarchy um, of authority on the ranch as well. But Candy goes on, he's a nice fella too, got a crooked back where a horse kicked him. So in Of Mice and Men, names are very important. John Steinbeck, um, all of our names really have got some deeper meaning. So with crooks, we can see that, you know, it literally represents his kind of crooked back where a horse kicked him. Again, we've got this violence associated with, with crook. He's been subjected to violence. But we've also got, you might want to think as well, what else could John Steinbeck have been saying through the name crooks? What else could be crooked? Could it be... Society? Could it be that society is broken in the way that people are treated because of their race? I'd encourage you to perhaps get a bit of paper and have a go at writing how you might explain the symbolism behind Crooks's name if it was in uh, an exam. And feel free to post it in the comments too. That would be great to see your ideas. So when uh, Lenny goes into Crooks's room, we get a really, really detailed description of his room and we learn quite a lot about him through it. So for starters, Crooks had his bunk in the harness room, a little shed that leaned off the wall of the barn. So all the other men sleep together in the bunkhouse, except for Crooks. Crooks is alone. He's, he's out with the horses. He's kind of outcast with the animals. So we've got this separation and we've also got Crooks being seen as lesser. And then scattered on the floor were a number of personal possessions. For being alone, Crooks could leave his things about. So the men in the bunkhouse probably have to be quite tidy, because if they left their things about, they'd get kicked or they'd get lost, whereas Crooks can leave his room how he wants, because people don't go in there. And John Steinbeck kind of emphasises that people don't go into his room um, quite a number, in a number of ways through his description. 
And it's interesting what other possessions uh, Crooks has. He had books too, so he's an educated man. He enjoys reading. He had a tattered dictionary and a mauled copy of the California Civil Code for 1905. A pair of gold rimmed spectacles hung from a nail on the wall above his bed. So first of all, a tattered dictionary. So the idea that it's tattered suggests that it is used quite a lot. So it suggests that Crooks perhaps cares about his expression. It ca- he cares about his vocabulary. And this dictionary has been used uh, frequently. And even more interestingly, we have a mauled copy of the California Civil Code for 1905. So mauled, um, it means, you know, again, similar to the dictionary, it's tattered. But I think it's interesting because mauled has connotations of violence. When we think about the verb to maul or mauling, it's often to do with, for example, a dog mauling someone, which means attacking or, or hurting. So again, we've got this idea of violence associated here. And the California Civil Code for 1905, in it, it says that everyone has equal rights. So Crooks knows what should be happening. Crooks knows his rights should be the same as everyone else's. But in practice, they aren't. So he lives in this horrible contradiction where he knows how his life should be. But he also knows that it can't be how it should be because things in society are too far behind. The room was swept and fairly neat, for Crooks was a proud, aloof man. He kept his distance and demanded that other people kept theirs. So Crooks really takes care of his room. And I think it's really quite poignant that he kept his distance, so he stays away from the other men, and demanded that other people kept theirs. So he doesn't want people to come close to him. Now, why might that be? I think it's a defence mechanism. I think actually Crooks has been hurt in his life by the racism in society and therefore how people have treated him. And actually it's easier if other people stay away from him because then he can't be hurt. If he doesn't get close to people, he can just create this life by himself, even if he's very lonely. But it's quite a sad line there, I think. So when we first see Crooks, we hear about him from Candy. But when we first see him, he sat in his bunk, his shirt was out of his jeans in the back. In one hand, he held a bottle of liniment and with the other, he rubbed his spine. So Crooks is in pain and he's rubbing this liniment oil on his spine. But again, we've got this idea of Crooks being associated with hurt and with pain. So it's interesting that that's the first time we meet him. He's by himself and he's in pain. And also, I think it's interesting that it's his back that's in is in pain because, you know, it, normally if your back hurts, it's a lot easier to get someone else to kind of rub something on it because your back isn't necessarily easy to kind of twist around and, and, and rub. So we've got this kind of discomfort image here of Crooks rubbing his own back because he does not have anyone else to do it for him. And as we said, um, you know, he's got his mauled copy of the 1905 California Civil Code. So Crooks knows his rights. So when Lenny comes in, he says to him, you got no right to come in my room. This is my room. Nobody got any right in here but me. So it's interesting that he repeats the word right. So Crooks knows how it should be. But then later on, we see that, first of all, Candy and then Curdy's wife also come in. And when he asks Curdy's wife to leave, she turns around and threatens him with violence. So again, we've got this idea that Crooks does have rights, but in practice, they aren't being upheld. So think about what John Steinbeck was trying to say here. And again, we've got this this, uh, defence mechanism. I ain't wanted the bunkhouse and you ain't wanted in my room. So Crooks knows that he can't go to be with the other men. And so therefore, because he's a proud man, he wants to keep his own space his own as well. If he can't go in the bunkhouse, he doesn't want people coming in his room because that's not fair. So he's also got some other defence mechanisms. So we see him when he first chats to Lenny and Lenny starts talking about George and then Crooks kind of teases him and says, what if what if um, George never comes back? So we've got a few quotes here. Crooks's face lighted with pleasure in his torture. So he realises that he's more intelligent than Lenny. So he realises that he can kind of um, make Lenny feel what he wants him to feel because he's 
he can manipulate him. So it's interesting that when he gets the opportunity, Crooks actually wants to um, hurt Lenny. And it's interesting that John Steinbeck uses violent language, pleasure in his torture. Nobody can't tell what a guy will do, he observed calmly. Let's say he wants to come back and can't. Suppose he gets killed or hurt, so he can't come back. So it's interesting that Crooks uh, uses the idea of being alone, uses the idea that Lenny will be alone as torture. So Crooks is alone. So it's almost like he takes pleasure in the idea that other people might have to face what he faces. And he kind of takes it further as well. Crooks bored in on him. Want me to tell you what will happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch. They'll tie you up with a collar like a dog. So again, Crooks keeps going with it. He doesn't just say the odd line. He really kind of drills in on Lenny here um, and wants Lenny to imagine what it would be like to be alone. But he can't take it too far because Lenny obviously gets mad um, and upset. And then Crooks saw the danger as it approached him. He edged back on his bunk to get out of the way. I was just supposing, he said. So again, the second that there's kind of violence threatened towards Crooks, he kind of backs off. So he edged back. So he, he knows that he can't take things too far. And then we have this kind of realisation when he talks to Lenny. Crook said gently, maybe you can see now. you got George. You know he's going to come back. Suppose you didn't have nobody. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play Rummy because you was black. How do you like that? Suppose you have to sit, sit out here and read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. A guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. So we've got this very poignant kind of monologue from Crooks here. And he really wants uh, Lenny to kind of put himself in his shoes, I think, because we've got this repetition of suppose, suppose, suppose. He wants Lenny to kind of imagine what it would be like to be him and to feel the loneliness he has. And he says a guy needs somebody. It's not want but like humans need people. We need society. We need each other. And the guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. So it's really sad to think about how crooks must feel being alone out in his room uh, all of the time as well, especially with what he says to Lenny here. And then Candy comes along and Candy says, oh, can I come in? And crook says, come on in. If everybody's coming in, you might just as well. It was difficult for Crooks to conceal his pleasure with anger. So he's pretending that he's angry. He's pretending like, oh, I don't want you in my room. Get out of my room. If I can come in the bank house, you can't come in. But I think his loneliness is so acute that actually he's he's getting more pleasure from this because at least he's talking to people. And even if you're annoyed at people, perhaps it's better to be around people and be annoyed than not be around them at all. And then when we think about Crooks and, and his dream, so when Candy and Lenny start talking about the idea that they're going to go um, and get this land and they're going to buy this land and uh, work on it together, Crooks puts himself forward. He hesitated. If you guys would want a hand to work for nothing, just his keep, why I'd come and lend a hand? I ain't so crippled I can't work like a son of a bitch if I want to. Now what's interesting is Crooks says this but immediately after he says this, Curly's wife comes in. So Candy gets to kind of entertain the idea of having a dream for a lot longer throughout the, the text. But for Crooks, as soon as he begins to think or begins to think that something might get better, Curly's wife enters and we know what she says to him. But let's go through it now. Crooks stood up from his bunk and faced her. I had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights coming in a coloured man's room. So he knows what his rights are, but she says, but she immediately comes back at him with violence. She turned on him in scorn. Listen, she said, you know what I can do to you if you open your trap? Crook stared hopelessly at her, and then he sat down on his bunk and drew into himself. She closed on him. You know what I could do? Crook seemed to grow smaller, and he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. So... As soon as Crooks tries to say, you know what, this is my room, you are not, you don't have the right to be in here. Curly's wife um, leverages her power as in her, you know, being white and having more um, privilege within society 
to make him feel small and to, and to kind of show him what she could do to him if she wanted to. And Crooks, as we see, he makes himself smaller, he presses himself against the wall, and he drew into himself. So it's almost like he shuts down a little bit when this happens, and he stared hopelessly at her. He knows that she's right, so he doesn't have any hope that things can be different. She goes on. Well, you keep your place then. I could get you strung up on a tree so easy it ain't even funny. Crooks had reduced himself to nothing. There was no personality, no ego, nothing to arouse either like or dislike. Crooks sat perfectly still, his eyes averted, everything that might be hurt drawn in. So Curly's wife, she might not have much power within society being a woman or on the ranch being a woman, but she has more than Crooks does. And so it's interesting with Curly's wife that she, um, you know, chooses to make herself feel more powerful by making Crooks feel small. But after she's left, Crooks acknowledges to Candy that he thinks she might have a point. So you guys coming in and setting made me forget what she says is true. So Crooks believes it. Um, he, he's kind of reminded that actually for him to get his dream is something that's very, very, very unlikely, if not impossible, to happen because of the colour of his skin in society. And then he goes further and says, uh, Candy, huh? Remember what I said about hoeing and doing odd jobs? Yeah, said Candy, I remember. Well, just forget it, said Crooks. I didn't mean it, just fooling. I wouldn't want to go no place like that. So he has this very, very brief moment where he says to Candy, I could come and work for you on this land. He perhaps has a tiny bit of hope. And then Curly's wife comes in immediately, is violent in her language towards him, and immediately Crooks realises this dream can't happen. And then interestingly, we've got this, this cyclical structure of the, of the chapter because the chapter ends as it begins. Crooks sat on his bunk and looked at the door for a moment and then he reached for the liniment bottle. He pulled out his shirt in back, poured a little liniment in his pink palm and reaching around, he fell slowly to rubbing his back. So like the beginning of the chapter, we've got this image of Crooks being alone and being in discomfort. And the idea that the chapter starts and ends the same way and the, and the idea that it's cyclical um, creates the impression that things are, not, are never going to change for Crooks. This is his life. He's not going to be able to get out of this cycle. Which brings us back to this question once again. What is John Steinmick trying to say about society in 1930s America? So have a think about everything we've covered in this video and maybe try and write down some of your ideas um, in case a question about crooks or racism or isolation and loneliness came up in the exam. And remember to post any questions or comments that you've got in the comment section below so that I can make sure that I cover anything you want me to cover in future videos.